Would you join me in opening your Bibles to Exodus chapter 17? Exodus is the second book of the Bible. We're beginning a new series, so glad you're here. I hope this uh, series proves to be uh, really, I hope, effective for us. Because here's, here's the thing. The name of the, the series is Strong and Courageous. For some of you, those words may be very familiar, especially with the idea that we're studying the life of Joshua, a character study over the next several weeks. Because those words, be strong and courageous, are the words that God gave to Joshua, <laughs> gave to Joshua uh, as, he was, uh, as he received the mantle of leadership after Moses had passed. For those of you that aren't aware of the history, let me just kind of put this a little bit in historical context for you. Joshua's life uh, really spanned uh, 110 years. He Basically, most of what was taking place happened about 1,400 years before Christ. Joshua's uh, claim to fame was he was the, prede- the, the uh, follower of Moses. After Moses had been used by God to lead God's people out of Egypt, it was Joshua's job, his calling, to lead God's people into the land of promise. So God used both Moses and Joshua to bring about his purpose. Joshua, some of you have heard me say this before, is among my favorite Old Testament faith heroes. His name is mentioned 27 times in the Pentateuch, in the first five books of the Bible, excluding Genesis, of course. 27 times his name is mentioned. He has an entire book that speaks of his life and of the conquests of God as he was able to lead God's people into the land of promise. His name is mentioned twice in the New Testament. Both times are found in the book of Hebrews. Once in chapter 4, and the second time in chapter 11 in the hero's roll call of faith. And why I think this series is so, I hope, timely is because of this. You and I are standing really at the trailhead of a new year. We don't know what kind of twists and turns are going to come along this path. We don't know what kind of highs and lows we're going to experience. But what we know is this, is that none of us are going to be able to predict this year. None of us know what's going to happen. And one of the things I love so much about Joshua is that what was laid on his shoulders was a tremendous responsibility. He was following a beloved, faithful hero. He was following a giant to the Israelite people. And and that's no easy task. And he was also tasked with the responsibility of leading. And that's no easy task either. But what we find in Joshua and why he has quickly become one of my favorite Old Testament heroes is that it seems like whatever came his way, he handled it. Whether it was a victory, whether it was a defeat, whether it was an act of faith or his prayer life, what we find in Joshua is that whatever came his way, it seems as though he handled it with integrity. He was a tremendous and is a tremendous example for us as we look and prepare for this journey into the year 2023. I pray that you and I would truly be able to embrace the challenges and the opportunities that this year is going to provide for us, and that we would do it strong and courageous. Exodus chapter 17, we find the first mention of Joshua. First time his name is mentioned. And why this is important is we're going to see what Joshua is doing, and it's going to give us some indication of what kind of a guy he really is. Join me, if you would, in Exodus chapter 17, verse 8 through 16. The Bible says, And Amalek came and fought with Israel at Rephidim. So Moses said to Joshua, Choose for us men, and go out and fight with Amalek. For tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill with the staff of God in my hand. So Joshua did as Moses told him, and fought with Amalek while Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. And whenever Moses held up his hand, Israel prevailed. And whenever he lowered his hand, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hands grew weary. 
So they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat on it, while Aaron and Ur held up his hands, one on one side and the other on the other side. So his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. And Joshua overwhelmed Amalek with, and his people with the sword. Then the Lord said to Moses, Write this as a memorial in a book, and recite it in the ears of Joshua, that I will utterly blot out the memory of Amalek from under heaven. And Moses built an altar and called the name of it, The Lord is my banner, saying, A hand upon the throne of the Lord. The Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. We see in the whole course of the Israelites birthing out of the brick pits and slavery in Egypt, we see that God immediately upon their birth enrolls them in the school of faith. You see this whole journey of God's people out of bondage into the land of promise is to be a school of faith. God is wanting to teach His children to rely on Him. Now, when, he come, when they come out, you know one of the first tests was that they had to trust because they're standing facing the Red Sea with the Egyptian army and their chariots thundering down on them. And you may remember that story that God told Moses to take his rod and to lay it out across the waters, and the waters parted. God's people marched across the Red Sea on dry land, and once they got over and the Egyptian army entered into the Red Sea, God closed the waters and their enemies were defeated. God, through an incredible battle, won that for the God's people. And then you may recall that once they get over, there are other issues that are taking place. They're thirsty. God performs a miracle in turning bitter water and making it sweet. You may remember that they're hungry and God provides manna. You may remember that they needed protection. God provided a pillar of cloud by day to keep them cool and a pillar of fire by night to keep them warm. You may remember that they needed, they needed water later again and, and Moses strikes the rock with the rod of God and water comes out. God is teaching them all along this journey to trust Him. And you know what? The, the lessons really haven't changed. Even though our journey may be different, and even though we are on our way to a promised land, God is still enrolling each of us as believers in the school of faith. He wants us to learn to trust and to continue to rely and to be dependent on Him. But something happens here. This is a new element in the lives of God's people. Before, if there was a battle, God fought it, but now something different happens. Amalek comes up to fight them. And what we learn when we take these cross-references is that in Deuteronomy chapter 25, Moses is recounting the history of God's people. And he reminds them of what Amalek did to them on this day. As they are coming out, they're coming up from the south. Amalek is, is up in the north. They're the descendants of Esau. They are south of Canaan. And they are getting ready to see, they're seeing this army come up literally up to their property. So Amalek circles around and comes up behind God's people, attacks them from the back. This is not a face-to-face -face battle. This is, this is wretched. They come up around behind and they attack them from their backside. They attack the weak and the tired that were lagging behind. So there's a battle that's taking place. And I need to remember as a follower of Christ that there are always going to be battles. See, you and I love victories. We love to sing that song, Victory in Jesus, don't we? It's one of our favorites. That's a, that's a Baptist staple. That's like our national. But let me tell you something. Even though we love the victories, there's one element that you have to have in order to have a victory, and that's a battle. You can't have a victory without a battle. And here, God's people are facing this battle. It's a surprise attack. Nobody's expecting it. Number one, the battle. So what happens? Surprise attack. Everybody's shocked. Everybody's stunned. Moses turns to Joshua and says, Joshua, I want you to assemble an army and go down there and fight. Wow. Can you imagine that? The only battle you've ever been a part of, God fought completely. 
God overturned the most powerful nation and caused them to release their grip on God's people, sending gnats and flies and locusts and frogs and pestilence and plague. God had them cross the Red Sea and defeated their army without one swipe of a sword from God's people. But now something takes place. God's teaching them a new chapter. God's teaching them through another scenario to put their faith and trust in Him. Friends, this year, I promise you, even though we don't know how this trail will unfold, one thing is true, and that is that every one of us will face battles. Some of them will be spiritual. Some of them will be physical. Some will be emotional. Some will be relational. You and I are going to be facing battles all through this year. And I hope that as we face these battles, we may face them in the same strong and courageous way that Joshua did. I want you to see how this battle works out. Number two, I want you to see the warriors. There are four names that we're introduced to in the story that takes place in the battle. And the first one that we're going to look at is Joshua. When this battle takes place, when the, when, when the Amalekites are coming up behind God's people, Moses says, Joshua, go get an army and go fight them. Now, you know what Joshua had been doing prior to this all his life? <laughs> Making bricks. He was a slave. And yet Moses trusts him. You can see that in this. He is introduced as though we should have known him all along. Moses comes to Joshua in the middle of this surprise attack. Everybody's caught off guard. They're, they're being attacked. They have to make decisions quickly. Who does Moses go to? Joshua. It shows that Moses knew and saw and understood something in Joshua that he was trustworthy and faithful. So he says, Joshua, go get some men and get out there and fight those guys. I'm going up on the mountain. This tells me that Joshua would have had to have been willing to do something that he may not have done before. As a slave in the brick pits. We don't have any record of him fighting before this. And now he's called to command an army. He's called to assemble an army. This tells me he's going to have to know those men. He's going to have to figure out where their strengths and where their weaknesses are and assemble them on the battlefield and something that none of them had done before. You know what I love? In the story of Joshua, in the first mention of Joshua's name, I want you to see what it says. Verse 9, So Moses said to Joshua, Choose for us men and go out and fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill with the staff of God in my hand. Verse 10, so Joshua did as Moses told him. Joshua, who will later become this great leader, is first a faithful servant. Moses says, go down there and fight. And the Bible records that Joshua did exactly what Moses told him to do. You know what I love about Joshua? Because there's no argument. There's no excuse. Moses made excuses to God when God called him to go back into Egypt to deliver God's people. No excuses from Joshua. Joshua, I need you to assemble right now. I need you to get a team together. I need you to go down there. I need you to be a SEAL Team 6 and knock these guys out. That's what I need, Joshua. And he does it. The second group of warriors, the second name of a warrior is Moses. Moses hatches this plan. Joshua, you go down there and fight him with the sword, and I'm going to go up on the mountain and fight him with prayer. Moses is highly visible on this mountain, and he takes a rod of God, the rod that had been used to execute the plagues on Egypt, the same rod that was used to divide the waters of the Red Sea, the same rod that was used just previous to this in chapter 17 to strike the rock and water to come out. You see, when Moses held that rod up, he was reminding the people that the battle belongs to the Lord. The same God that got us out of Egypt is going to bring us the victory today. 
And Moses in this highly visible spot up on the mountain is holding this rod, keeping everybody's focus on God. The rod of God. He is touching the throne of God, as he says. And as he's holding it, something mysterious happens. We don't really understand it. We don't know if this was something divine or if this was just the influence of that picture on God's people. But when Moses' arms started to drop, Amalek advanced. But when Moses' arms would go back up, the Israelites would advance. Isn't that incredible? We don't understand how it all fleshed out, but we know it's true that when they drop, Israel's backing up, and when they would go back up, Israel would advance. Moses recognized this. And as he sees his hands start to drop and the army start to go back, he would raise it back up, but eventually, as we all do, his arms get tired. So what happens? Enter the next two men, Aaron and Ur. Aaron is the brother of Moses, and it's, it's, he, some historians have said that, that Ur was actually the husband of Miriam, Moses' sister. And here they are with Moses up on top of the mountain. You know what I love about these guys? They recognize something. They recognize what Henry Blackaby said in Experiencing God, that well-known quote when he said, see where God is working and join Him there. Do you know what Aaron and her did? They were perceptive to what was going on. When Moses' arms would fall and Israel would back up and Moses would raise his arms again, they were perceptive enough to realize we've got to hold his arms up. If there's going to be a victory, we have to come alongside Moses. Let me ask you a question. Of these three groups, Joshua, Moses, Aaron, and Ur, which one was most important to the victory? Was it Joshua, Moses, or Aaron and Ur? Yes. Yes. They all three played a role in the victory, though in different ways. Joshua was down in the valley fighting with the sword. Moses was on the mountain fighting in prayer. And Aaron and Ur are coming alongside and supporting him. Listen, guys, no wonder Israel won. I'm not trying to put all of this on the people of God because the victory came from God. But can you imagine being those Israelites fighting down in the valley and looking up and seeing Moses, your leader? Moses, the man of God that God used, holding the rod of God up like that? I mean, can you imagine that emblem of faith, knowing that he is praying and seeking God on behalf of those down in the valley? And then, can you imagine them fighting and they're getting tired and they look up and they see Moses and Ur holding up the arms of Moses? Man, everybody playing a part. No wonder God used that. Church, let me tell you something. God has a great plan for this church. God is already working his great plan in this church. He's not just now starting it. But think about it. God wants to use each one of us in different ways. God wants to use us in the battle plan of bringing the kingdom of God, advancing the kingdom. Some of you may be down in the valley fighting. Some of you may be up on the mountain praying. And others may be supporting those who are in those positions. Either way, God used all three of these groups. What's the outcome? Number three. The outcome. Spoiler alert, Israel wins. Not only does Israel win, they secure the number one seed. Okay? You're going to find throughout the story of Joshua there are many wins. You're going to find out through this story there are also losses. And you're going to get to see him handle both. What do we learn? What's the outcome? Israel wins. God fights for his people. 
God does what he says he's going to do. It was true 3,400 years ago. It's true now. God used the lives of other people to bring the victory in this. We are introduced to an amazing man named Joshua. Let me tell you something, guys. Because we have the privilege of looking through all of God's Word, we learn this. This, what we see in Joshua, is not a flash in the pan. This is who the man is. Faithful, courageous, bold, obedient, humble. You know what I love about Joshua? He's willing to be down in the valley while others are more visible on the mountain. He was okay with that. He was okay to do what he told, was told. Let me tell you something, guys. Joshua did the first little things right. And that matters. David, before he was ever a giant slayer and a king, was a good shepherd and a faithful son. Before Abraham ever became the father of a nation, he was a faithful follower of God. Before the disciples ever became fishers of men, they had to stop being fishers of fish. Peter had to give up the family business before he could inherit the keys of the kingdom. What am I saying? I'm saying that God is not looking for our great accomplishments what God is looking for are men and women who are going to be faithful in the first small things. Listen to what Jesus says regarding small things. Luke 16.10, one who is faithful in a very little is also faithful in much. And one who is dishonest in a very little is also dishonest in much. And these very familiar words, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. As men especially, we get this idea that when, when something big comes, I'm going to rise to the challenge. When that great spiritual battle presents itself, I'm your man, God. But let me tell you something. If you and I aren't winning the small battles... If you and I aren't being faithful in the small first things, I promise you it's going to be really hard for us to rise to the challenge when the battle gets bigger. You and I prove ourselves, not to God, but we prove ourselves. We are prepared in the small things, the first things, the first obedience. You may be looking at yourself saying, you know, what? Well, what does that mean for me? I promise you, the very first place God is looking for faithfulness is in your heart, in your mind, in your thoughts. Those places that nobody else knows and no algorithm can reach. God is looking for faithfulness here and here. God is looking for faithfulness in your homes. God is looking for faithfulness in your marriage. God is looking for faithfulness in what you look at and what you say and what you do in those small things. God is looking for faithfulness in you following Him day to day, moment by moment. One of my favorite heroes, modern times, is a woman by the name of Amy Carmichael. Her picture's up on the screen. Many of you have heard her story. She was a missionary to India and ministered to some of the poorest of India. She was the mother to many orphan girls who would have been sacrificed and abused in the temples in India. She was an Irish girl born to a wealthy family. And they loved Jesus. They were church-going folks. They were a church-going family. And they were very rich and very powerful, very influential in Belfast. And this woman who would grow up to be a powerful force for the kingdom of God in the orphanages of India. She can trace back her call of God and how God got a hold of her life by one moment. This woman can trace it back to one single incident. She was a teenager. Her and her family were leaving church with all of their other influential friends, walking down the sidewalk, going home. And as they were walking home, 
Amy looks up ahead of her on the sidewalk and sees this old woman, a very poor woman who stunk, Amy said. And she could see her loaded down with this this big bag of sticks on her back. She's going home to use that for a fire to keep warm. And this poor old woman is carrying this thing of sticks. And Amy's like, oh no, I'm supposed to help her. I don't want to help her. What are other people going to think? What are they going to say? Because she could see the looks and the stares at this old poor woman. And Amy realized, I'm going to help her. And Amy walked over and took some of the sticks off of that woman and carried them herself and convinced her sisters that they needed to help. So here are these three girls, very rich, very influential, very well off. They are walking with this poor woman's sticks to relieve her. Amy said in her own words that other people were actually crossing on the other side of the street to stay away from us. It was that moment, that moment As she's carrying those sticks, a very familiar verse comes to her mind, and she said in her own words, it was as though someone was speaking it in my ear. This is the verse. Now, if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become manifest, for the day will disclose it. Because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. If the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, so he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. Amy knew that moment. I want my life to matter, and I don't care about the fawnings or the frowns of the world. From that moment on, she sought to share the gospel with everyone. And God called her to the mission field in India. Why? Because she was faithful in the first small thing. Brothers, sisters, what is that first small thing for you? What is it? Have you ever been saved? That's the first. The first of the first of the first. God, I know I'm a sinner. And I know that Jesus came to the earth to live the perfect life, to meet the standard of God's holiness that I can't meet. And he died on the cross, and three days later, he was raised again to prove that he is who he said he was and that that sacrifice was accepted. And today... I place my faith and trust completely in the finished work of Jesus on the cross. I confess you as my Lord and Savior. I turn from my old life and give my life to you. At that moment when you pray that from your heart to God's, the Bible says you become born again. Maybe, maybe maybe it's a step of obedience and baptism. Maybe that's a first small step. Maybe it's making an apology. Maybe it's a confession of sin. Maybe it's something you're to start doing, and maybe it's something you're to stop doing. Faithfulness is proven in the small things, the first things, the hidden things. And today, if there's business that you need to do with God, would you take care of that? Father, this morning, it's amazing to think that you can bring about such a big change in one moment. Father, I pray that this morning we would be trained by hearts that love you to learn to say yes without any reservation to you. God, thank you for your willingness and desire to use us and incorporate us into your plan. Help make us, Father, more of a part. Help us to make us more pliable and willing to be used by the great God of creation. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey, thanks so much for listening to our podcast at First Baptist Joplin. If you are interested in coming and worshiping with us live, we would love for you to come at 9 and 1030 on Sunday mornings.